thank you all for coming out. Uh, my name is Bill Giroux, and my book, The Matthews Men, is the uh, uh, story of the largely forgotten heroics and sacrifices of the U.S. Merchant Marine during World War II. Um, I tell the story through the exploits, really, of a unique brotherhood of merchant sea captains and merchant mariners from Matthews County, Virginia. Matthews County is a rural outpost on the Chesapeake Bay. It's a county that sticks sparsely populated, sticks way out into the bay. Um, it's really the land that time forgot, even today. There is not a stoplight in Matthews. It is, uh, there's very little in Matthews, and Matthews is not on the way anywhere. So the people in Matthews have a saying that one never goes to Matthews unless going to Matthews. <laughs> so Matthews is isolated, but it's not isolated in a kind of a creepy deliverance type isolated. It's a very <laughs> friendly place. And when I was, I lived there briefly back in the 80s. I was a newspaper reporter, and there's a lot of fishing there, and I'd go interview fishermen. And often when I'd talk to a guy, we'd have a nice conversation. At the end of the conversation, he would present me with a fish and say, Here's a nice flounder I caught this morning. And I would say, Oh, you know, I, I can't really. But he would insist, and I, you know, I was rude to refuse. And it happened so often that I began. I got a styrofoam cooler and put it in the trunk of my car <laughs> with a sheet of newspapers and so for, to wrap gift fish in. Because you can't just put them on the floorboard of your car. I, I tried that once with very poor results. <laughs> so because Matthews is isolated, uh, it has always been more part of the sea than of the land. And since before the revolution, it has been a cradle of merchant sea captains and merchant mariners. And uh, the, the merchant mariners, the U.S. Merchant Marine, for those of you who are not familiar with that, it sounds like a branch of the military, but it's not. It's a uh, loosely organized group of civilians who sail privately owned ships um, for profit, hauling cargo and people uh, from port to port. Uh, the Merchant Marine has been around since it really predates the U.S. Navy in our country, and it's been a big part of our history, but you don't, in peacetime, you don't hear a lot about it. I mean, today's Merchant Marine, uh, today it's the, it's the people that all the, drive the big container ships, you know, that are piled high with containers. But during wartime, and this has been true all throughout our history, and it's true now, uh, the Merchant Marine is always... It's always become sort of an adjunct to the military, uh, hauling supplies for the military. The military has some supply ships, but not nearly enough of them to carry what it means. So the Merchant Marine, and this was especially true in World War II, it hauled guns, ammunition, uh, planes, tanks, boats, uh, jeeps, trucks, food, medical supplies, pretty much everything that the Allied troops needed to survive and fight in foreign battlefields. Uh, they were the supply line, the, <coughs> the freighters and the tankers and the men who sailed. And for that reason, everywhere the Merchant Marines sailed and the Matthews men sailed during World War II, they were attacked by German U-boats. And the U-boats' mission, their main mission, this is what they were focused on, was to try to cut the supply line, to sink as many merchant ships as they could. They would sink more ships if they got the opportunity, but they were, they were there to sink merchant ships because the Germans knew that if we, if the United States, was able to project its industrial power, its economic power, its manpower across the ocean to the battlefields of Europe, the Germans would lose the war. So the U-boats attacked merchant ships uh, everywhere. They attacked them in the Arctic because we were hauling supplies to Russia, which was our ally against the Nazis in World War II. They attacked them in the South Atlantic, off the coast of Brazil, South Africa, attacked them in the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, right at the mouth of the Mississippi River, all along the Texas coast. And they attacked them all along the East Coast. They sank ships in front of tourists in Florida, and in Virginia Beach, where I lived, uh, one U-boat captain wrote 
in his memoirs that he uh, remembered seeing the Coney Island Ferris wheel from the from his uh, the conning tower. They got right up on our shores, and they even would use our shorelines of, of coastal cities like uh, Atlantic City, Miami Beach, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, um, to silhouette the ships. The ships were had all the lights out so nobody could see them. But when they the U boats would sit. You know, seaward of them, and they would wait for the silhouettes of these ships to pass against the lights of our cities, and they would line them up for torpedo strikes, like uh, like ducks in a shooting gallery. And they were so successful; they were sinking so many of our merchant ships and killing so many of our merchant mariners that in the first year of the war, a publisher of merchant mariners textbooks hurried into print a little skinny volume called How to Abandon Ship. And it was just like it sounds. It was a step-by-step -step guide to how to avoid getting killed when your ship was torpedoed. And it had advice about you know how to launch lifeboats, how to navigate in a lifeboat. It even had a section about how to survive if you were marooned on a remote island in the Arctic. And there was a subsection to that about how to kill and eat polar bears. <laughs> now, for the record, when you kill a polar bear, you shoot him right behind the shoulder blades, because that way you're sure to pierce his heart. You do not shoot him in the water, because you're not going to be able to drag him out. If you kill him, don't cook him. He's too tough. You're going to have to eat him raw. And the, the book stressed this, um, that no matter how hungry you are, no matter how desperate you are, avoid polar bear liver. <laughs> Now, there's no uh, no record that I have found of a maroon merchant crew ever killing and eating a polar bear, or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that these guys felt it necessary to put this in the book will maybe give you an idea of how serious a problem this was. Uh, at the beginning of the war, the United States really let these mariners down. We didn't have a lot of ships and planes to protect them. And the ones we did have, we didn't put to that purpose. We would send them out there time and again uh, from one port to another, just hoping that they wouldn't run into a U-boat. Because if they did, they were, that was it. Um, at the end of the war, we let them down again. They weren't part of the GI Bill. They weren't uh, part of really any veterans benefits, but most of them were too old to um, enjoy the benefits of most of them. And they've pretty much been uh, left out of the history books. You don't read about them. A lot of people, even in coastal cities like the one I live in, don't know what the Merchant Marine is. So the Matthews men is their story, as best I can tell it. And I've, I've written it uh, not like a history text, but like an adventure story, because that's how I see it. It's these guys were doing their jobs. They uh, were presented with an enormous challenge. They passed through the fire. They helped win the war and save the world. So um, the book has got more than uh, 70 photos. And a lot of these photos have been pulled out of sea chests and attics in uh, Matthews County. But a lot more, there's action shots that I got from the National Archives and various museums. So I'd like to show you a few of the pictures now that I think will help give you a feel for the book. And I'll, uh, I'll start with the ring. This is a gold signet ring bearing the initials GDH. And that stands for George Dewey Hodges. Captain Dewey Hodges was a Matthews sea captain. He's one of the seven brothers in the uh, subtitle of the book. And Dewey was wearing this ring in July 1942 when his little freighter was torpedoed off the coast of Cuba by a U-boat. And he was killed. Lost, as they say in Matthews. Shortly thereafter, this ring, along with a, some human remains, was discovered by a fisherman in the belly of a big shark, caught in the waters not far from where the ship went down. Some very well-intentioned people in Cuba managed to get the ring back to Virginia, back to Dewey's family, thinking that this would bring comfort or closure or such a thing as it was possible. But unfortunately, uh, the return of the ring uh, brought the family mainly uh, pain and confusion. Uh, this is Dewey, Captain Dewey Hodges. And to me, Dewey 
personified some of the best qualities of the Matthews man. He uh, had very little formal education. He only finished the fourth grade, but he managed to rise to the peak of his profession, which was to command a ship, the master of a ship. And in Matthews, that really had special meaning. Matthews was a maritime community. Um, mothers and fathers in Matthews didn't dream of their children, their, their sons becoming doctors or lawyers or politicians. For them, that was being a mariner, being the captain of a ship, was the ultimate achievement. Uh, Dewey was an outstanding captain. He was about as much a family man as you could be if you were a captain because you were at sea all the time. And he, he unlike some of the captains who could be tyrants, um, he took care of his men. He looked out for them. And he never forgot where he came from. In Matthews, there were not a lot of opportunities. Again, an isolated place. You either fished or you farmed, you cut timber, or you went to sea. And Dewey always hired all the Matthews men he could for his crews. Always had at least a half a dozen Matthews guys on his ship. And part of the reason was all these men from Matthews had grown up on the water. They knew how to, they were good mariners. But part of the reason is he wanted to give them an opportunity. He saw himself and some of these young guys saw it as a way they could get ahead in the world. And when he would come home from his ship, his ship often would be based on the Delaware River. He'd come home to Matthews for a weekend uh, to visit. He would put out word around Matthews of any jobs he had on his ship or anywhere else in, you know, on the docks up there. And if a man was interested in one of those jobs, all he had to do was be standing outside of Richardson's Drugstore on Main Street in Matthews at 1 p.m. on Sunday when Dewey was on his way back. Dewey would pull up in his car, pick the guy up, drive him to the docks, and sign him aboard the ship. And this was one of the ways in which tiny little Matthews, who had only, which had only about 8,500 people, uh, sent men, had men scattered on ships on the world's oceans. Dewey's entire family was invested in the merchant marine. His seven brothers and his formidable father. Uh, Dewey, in this picture, is the third from the left on the top row. He is looking rather formal in his captain's uniform, which is unusual. Normally, he was a very jovial character. But there was absolutely nothing jovial about the guy on the top left. This is Dewey's father, Captain Jesse Hodges, the patriarch of the Hodges family. Captain Jesse, as everybody called him, was a tough, no-nonsense tugboat captain. He was a consummate mariner, great ship hand, but he was also a consummate SOB. <laughs> he didn't suffer fools, or greenhorns, or idlers, or really anybody gladly. And he was just, um, when I was, and I'll show you this one, bigger, this is the same picture, bigger. Um, when I was working on this book, one of his grandsons gave me this picture, this portrait of Captain Jesse. Let me mean, look at it. And I hung this portrait right by my computer, right by my workstation. Anytime I felt like quitting early for the day, <laughs> I just kind of look up and see him glaring down at me, and I think, all right, I'll. You know, I'll go a little bit longer. He just had that effect on people, had that effect on everybody. Um, Captain Jesse had gone to sea at the age of 10, 10, and he had spent most of his life at the wheel of a tugboat. He rarely came home for more than a couple of days at a time, a couple of times a year, to see his long suffering wife, Henrietta, and his family. And when he did come home, he was on land so rarely that he was really pretty clueless in all matters relating to land, with one exception. Every time he came home, he seemed to leave Henny, Henrietta, with another child. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, they had 14 children in all. <laughs> the Hodges' children accumulated so quickly that the Hodges ran out of names. And they actually named their 14th and last child Hilda 14 Hodges. <laughs> um, Captain Jesse encouraged all his sons, all seven of his sons, to go to sea. Again, this was a way to make something of yourself in Matthews, and that's what he wanted. He wanted to make something of 
himself. Six of the seven brothers became merchant sea captains, became masters of ships. And the seventh, who was named Spencer, started out on that track, but he injured his back on his brother Dewey's ship, and he had to go ashore. Uh, Spencer went on to become sheriff of Matthews County, and he also became sort of an unofficial recruiter for his brother's ships. Anytime one of his brothers needed a new guy on the ship, they'd get hold of Spencer and Matthews, and he'd hunt around Matthews until he found somebody that wanted a job. Usually he'd find some poor guy, you know, plowing at the back of a mule or something, and get him, they'd put him on a bus, send him to the docks, and he would, uh, you know, go to sea. That was another way that Tiny Matthews scattered men all over the ocean of the world. Um, all of the Hodges brothers very different, like siblings in a lot of families. And I'll, I'll leave the book to introduce you to the others. But I want to tell you something about Captain Jesse's wife, Henrietta. This is Henrietta. Uh, she is in the company of a goat, and she is churning butter. And Henrietta is one of my favorite characters in the book. The book is not just about the Mariners, it's about their families as well. She was not a mariner, but she was the glue that held the Hodges family together. And this is true in a lot of maritime families, a lot of military families, that the, the spouse that is at home has to do a lot. They have to be resourceful, they have to be smart, they don't have to work hard, they have to know how to do everything. And that was Henny. Uh, Henny worked long hours, pretty much every day of her life. She not only reared this huge family that Captain Jesse kept adding to and leaving her to deal with. But she also ran the Hodges 40-acre farm. Um, she would, and the farm, if Matthews was an outpost, the farm was an outpost of an outpost. It had no electricity, no running water, no indoor plumbing, no telephone, no radio. Everything on the farm had to be done the old-fashioned way, and Henny was in charge of all of it. And her children and grandchildren grew up believing that she was superhuman. One of her grandkids told me, you know, when I was growing up, I honestly believed that if I had accidentally cut off my arm and the elbow, that Henny could have fixed it. <laughs> but Henny had led a very hard life, I mean, as I've described. And she also, uh, two of her children, she had watched die before her eyes at a very young age. And she was given to bits of crying three or four times a day without any immediate provocation. She would break down and begin to sob. And when this would happen, she would hide it from people. She would throw herself into her work until the feeling passed. And unfortunately, the U-boat girl would give her more cause for sorrow. The map, the, the Hodges were by no means the only family in Matthews that was heavily invested in the Merchant Marine. Lots of families in Matthews had several members in the Merchant Marine. And at the height of the U-Boat War, pretty much every family in Matthews either had a family member on the deck of a merchant ship or a very close friend. And as a result, Matthews experienced the U-Boat War to its absolute fullest. This is a U-Boat. This is a U-boat uh, plowing through some rough seas uh, in the North Atlantic. The, uh, in the background is a merchant ship. An encounter between a U-boat and a merchant ship was a very unequal encounter. Most of the merchant ships in World War II were, many of them were very old. Uh, they were slow. Frequently they'd be overloaded, sometimes with volatile cargo like artillery shells or gasoline. And most of them were unarmed. Uh, as the war went on, the Navy, uh, the government began retrofitting these ships, putting gun tubs on them, and putting Navy gun crews on there to protect them. But through no fault of those gun crews, putting a gun tub on a merchant ship was not a good way to protect it from U-boats. And a lot of the Navy men died right alongside the merchant mariners when the ships went down. U-boats were faster than the vast majority of merchant ships at sea. And they were armed to the teeth. They had torpedoes, of course, their signature weapon. And a lot of them had these fearsome guns, these deck cannons mounted on the foredeck of the U-boat that would, were powerful enough to sink a ship without even the U-boat uh, the commander having to spend a precious torpedo. 
Uh, U-boats have sort of a mystique about them as these, they're, they're these ultimate weapons, or it was only U-boats. Well, one of the things I try to show in this book is that U-boats really had a lot of weaknesses and vulnerabilities. They weren't submarines the way we think of submarines today, you know, like the nuclear subs that can stay underwater for months at a time and not even, you know, contact the outside world. U-boats functioned much better on the surface. They were diving vessels. They could dive for short periods of time to get in position for an attack or to escape from pursuers. But they were slower than pretty much any of the ships or planes that hunted them. And if they could be located, found, and driven underwater, they were pretty helpless. And they had to depend on the wiles, the cleverness uh, of the U-boat commander to try to outsmart or outwit their hunters and allow them to fight another day. You know, some of you may have seen the great German U-boat movie, Das Boot. And in that movie, there the U-boat guys are in the, their the U-boat has been driven underwater and the men are, are that their depth charges are exploding all around them, the men are powering, the lights are flickering, the air is getting thin, and all those men know that if one of those depth charges gets close enough, it's gonna crack the hull of that submarine like an eggshell, and every man in that sub is gonna die. Uh, even on a good day, life in a U-boat was brutal. The air was foul, the food was often rancid, the, uh, it was so it was such close quarters in there that the men literally slept on top of torpedoes, which were stored under their bunks. Uh, but for all those all those things, U-boats were very effective weapons. They could, they were ship sinking machines, and they were especially effective when they could be placed in situations where they had a lot of targets and very weak defenses. The head of the German U-boat command, Admiral Karl Dunitz was a master of constantly, his great skill was shifting his U-boats around constantly to different parts of the ocean to place them at what was at any given moment the weakest point in the Allied supply line. And for most of the first year that America was in World War II, the weakest point by far was the coastline of the United States. This is a American merchant ship the Liberty ship Thomas McKean, under attack by a U-boat. U-boat has already torpedoed the Thomas McKean and now is pummeling it with its deck hammer. And I've included this photo mainly to give you a sense of what it was like to be a merchant mariner and try to escape with your life when your ship was torpedoed or under attack. It was a tremendous challenge. The first torpedo strike often occurred in the dead of night with no warning. Uh, the torpedo would explode, it would set the ship on fire. These ships, uh, they were old, they weren't well reinforced. They would sink some of them in just a minute or two. And a lot of the men that died in them never even got out of their quarters. They were just entombed at the bottom of the sea when the ship went down. If you did manage to get out on the main deck during an attack, or if you were on watch when, when the attack occurred, you would, might encounter something like this. There's fire everywhere. The U-boat might still be shooting at the ship. Um, the deck might be listing, tilting steeply. Very hard to launch a lifeboat or a raft under those circumstances, even if you practiced it. Uh, the water might be rough. It might be freezing cold. It might be full of sharks. It might even be on fire. Because in many cases, when a ship was attacked, the oil tanks or the, if it was the cargo tanks, if it was a tanker, would break open, the stuff would spill out on the surface of the water, it would float, it would ignite, and it would create a flaming oil slick all around the sinking ship. So any man that tried to save his life by jumping off of that ship and landed in that flaming oil would be severely burned, if not killed outright. If you did manage to get through all that, get out on a lifeboat or a raft, your problems might be just beginning. Because these lifeboats in World War II were just open boats. They were sturdy, but they were open. And if you were in them, you were exposed to breaking waves, uh, cold, snow, sleet, wind, broiling heat. And you might have to be in that lifeboat for days or weeks or even months. Some of these lifeboats drifted for thousands of miles people in them just hoping they would be lucky enough to uh, cross paths with a ship 
who had rescued them, or crunch ashore on some island where they could bushwhack their way through the brush or the jungle and get help. Uh, it was a trip, it was a really a, a gauntlet of perils. But a lot of men, and a lot of men, thousands of men were killed in this way. But many, many more survived torpedoings. And a lot of times when they would survive, usually when they would, they would go home, they'd get right back on another ship, they'd sail right out, sometimes through the same waters, and they'd get torpedoed again. A number of Matthews men were torpedoed <coughs> multiple times. One guy was torpedoed 10 times. Um, this ship here, the Thomas McKean, was the second of three ships to be torpedoed out from under one Matthews sea captain named Mellon Respus. And Mellon survived the first torpedo in pretty good shape. He got right in a lifeboat, got home, went back on the Thomas McKean. He survived this one too, but he was badly injured. He spent weeks in a hospital in Trinidad. And when he finally got well enough, he was still in bad shape, but he finally got well enough to travel. He was able to get passage on another Matthews captain's <coughs> ship to get home to recuperate and see his wife. And while that ship was on the way home, it was torpedoed. Uh, uh, one note here that the U boat that sank the Thomas McKean in this is the U 505. And some of you may know this, but the U 505, two years after this incident, was captured at sea by the U.S. Navy in a very daring exploit and brought back to the United States. And today, the U-505 is intact, on display, at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And if you go to the museum, you've been there, see, you can squeeze through that U-boat from bow to stern and come out of there with a pretty good idea of what it was like to serve in one of these things during, uh, during World War II. And if you get there early, and you may have a few this, if you get there early, there's some retired American submariners that'll take you through there and show you, you know, this, this is what this is, this is how this works. So it's a it's a very interesting experience. This the U boat is kept in this this huge underground chamber. So I uh, I recommend it. it. It's interesting. I think maybe the most maybe the most striking thing I encountered in researching this book was the encounters between U-boats and the survivors of the ships that they sank. It was very common for a U-boat to sink a ship and then surface and approach the survivors in lifeboats and on rafts. And usually what the Germans wanted was information. They would glare down at these helpless men from the conning tower, pull out a machine gun, and interrogate them. What was the name of your ship? What was your cargo? What was your destination? What was your ton what was the ship's tonnage? Tonnage is so you know is cargo capacity. So that and that's how the Germans kept score and how they were doing in the U-boat war. How much tonnage were they sinking? And when the Germans got answers to these questions, and often the men in the lifeboats lied to them, but when they would get answers to these questions, very often the U-boat would submerge and move off and leave men like this to the mercy of the sea, which in many cases was, was their mercy at all. But what struck me about it is that a number of U-boat commanders could not bring themselves to do this. They were dedicated to sinking these guys' ships. That was their mission. But once the ship was sunk, once this precious war cargo was at the bottom of the sea, they couldn't, they, they felt uncomfortable leaving men to die. And they usually were men in lifeboats and on rafts, and the U-boats would approach them, and after interrogating them, they would give them food, give them water, offer them medical attention, uh, give them the course to the nearest land. Sometimes they would even tow them part of the way to land. Uh, one of the Matthews men was uh, torpedoed in the Caribbean, and shortly he's in a lifeboat, and suddenly the U-boat surfaces right next to them, almost capsizes the lifeboat. Everybody in that lifeboat must have been thinking, this is the year. But instead, the U-boat commander emerges from the hatch and apologizes for having had to sink an American ship. He said, you had a beautiful ship. He uh, gives them food, offers them medical attention. He gives them 40 packs of German cigarettes, 
<laughs> some boxes of French cookies okay. because the U-boat is based in occupied France. And he gives them a big 10-gallon jug of drinking water. Uh, and before he hands over the drinking water, he squeezes fresh limes into the drinking water. Mm. And what he's doing is introducing vitamin C into this water uh, to fortify these men against scurvy, the vitamin deficiency disease, in the event they have to be at sea in the lifeboat for a long time. As he's, the U-boat is pulling away, the U-boat commander calls out to them, uh, come and see me in Germany after the war, after this is all over. Uh, another U-boat commander astonished the men in a lifeboat by asking them how the Brooklyn Dodgers baseball team was doing. <laughs> <laughs> the U-boat commander had lived in Brooklyn with his family during the war, and he was, he was into the Dodgers. But I don't want to give you the, the, the sense that the U-boat war was some sort of clubby, chummy affair. It was anything but. And these examples, although there are a number of them, and there's a number of them in the book, they were the exceptions rather than the rule. And uh, many of these U-boat commanders were just as cold as the water that they operated in. And I don't think anything illustrates that better than this next photograph. This is a close-up photograph of the last one I just showed you. This is taken from by a um, Nazi propaganda photographer, who these guys, the photographers often rode in U-boats to chronicle their death and destruction for the, uh, the folks back home. This photograph shows seven men on a raft. These are the last, the only seven men to get off alive from a torpedoed oil tanker called the Scoby. All the other, there were 34 men on the ship. Only these guys got off a lot. They are hundreds of miles from land. It's March. And the raft they're on is really just a slab of wood nailed to some floating drawings. So it's better than swimming. But it's not going to keep these guys alive for very long out there. And if you look at the picture, some of them, and there's a picture of, of a little easier to see in the book. Some of them seem to know that. Some of them are shouting at the U-boat, but others are just staring. I mean, they're, they're staring off into space. They know that nothing can save them, and nothing did. None of these men was ever seen again. None of the 34 men on the Muscogee was ever seen again. The Allies didn't even know what happened to the Muscogee. It just didn't show up in court where it was scheduled, and after a couple of weeks, they classified it as presumed sunk by submarine. That was not unusual for a ship to just disappear in the U-boat war. 33 American ships just disappeared like that. Uh, sunk in far reaches, remote reaches of the ocean, witnessed only by the men who sank them, killed them. Um, and their, the loved ones of these families went to their graves, usually without ever knowing anything. As it happened, the fate of the men of the Muscogee or did become known in a very unusual way. Many years later, in the late 1980s, the son of the Muscogee's captain, a guy named George Betts, got hold of some declassified Navy documents and figured out which U-boat had sunk his father's ship. Uh, Mr. Betts then tracked down the U-boat commander. He was a retired businessman in Germany, in Bremen, and he wrote him a letter. And he said, I'm not angry that you killed my father. It was an act of war. But I would like to know what happened. And the U-boat commander wrote back to him. He arranged for him to get this picture and some other photos. And he said, yes, I torpedoed your father's ship. We regret it having to leave these men out here like this. We gave them food. We gave them water. But there was nothing more we could do. We didn't have room on our new boat to take them prisoner. We barely had room for our own guys. And anyway, we were on our way, when we sank them, we were on our way to the coast of the United States to begin our mission. So, regrettably, we had to leave them there. The, uh, Mr. Betts did not stop there. He spent two years after that tracking down family members of all the men who had died on the Muscogee and writing them letters to tell them what he had learned from the U-boat commander. And most of the families were very grateful. They said, oh, you know, thank you, at least after all these years, now we know something. Uh, they even helped him identify <coughs> two of the guys on this 
in this picture. So we know who two of the last seven survivors of Muskogee were. But not all the families were happy to hear from Mr. Betts. And one of the families he wrote was the family of Matt Foster, who was from Matthews County. And he said he believed that Matt, Mr. Betts believed that Matt Foster was on the raft, that he was the fourth guy from the left. And he wrote to the Foster family, he said, can you confirm, you know, this is what happened. Can you confirm for me that this was Matt Foster? And in return, he got a very short letter and it said, we cannot confirm this and we do not wish to receive any further information. So not everybody wanted to relive the horrors of the U-boat. The book is full of stories like this, most of which I had never heard before, and I, I, I don't think you ever heard before. The reason that you never heard them is that they did not take place during famous battles that have been well documented. They took place during these lonely encounters out at sea between U-boats and merchant ships. And the book has a story of the lifeboat baby. This is a baby who was born in a lifeboat at sea after his mother's ship was torpedoed in a storm off Cape Hatteras. The book has a story about a ship's engineer, a really resourceful guy who saved the lives of everybody in his lifeboat by cobbling together scraps, odds and ends from the lifeboat in building a still, which he used to convert seawater into drinkable water. The book has the story of Ernest Hemingway's unusual adventures in the U-boat war. Hemingway, as some of you may know, lived in Cuba during 1942. He was fishing for marlins in his beloved fishing boat. And he somehow persuaded the U.S. government to issue him a machine gun, a bunch of hand grenades, and commissioned him to patrol the north coast of Cuba for U-boats. Um, Hemingway's plan was to wait until a U-boat came close enough to his, you know, out of curiosity, came close to his fishing boat, pull out the machine gun, sweep the deck, chase the Germans down the hatch, and throw the hand grenades in after them. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll leave it to you to judge whether that was a good plan or not. But as a, as a reader, I... I am grateful that Hemingway never got anywhere near a U-boat, because at that point he had yet to write The Old Man of the Sea and some of his other books. He did get enough information, he did patrol the coast of Cuba for U-boats, and he got enough information to write another novel. And this novel is not one of his more highly regarded novels, and in fact it was published after his death. It is called Islands in the Stream. And in that novel, a very Hemingway-like protagonist hunts U-boats in a fishing boat off the coast of Cuba. I've got, uh, the, again, the book is full of stories, and I could tell you some more, but I want to leave some time for your questions. I do want to tell you very briefly a little bit about what happened to the Merchant Marine after the war. Um, and I'll use this. This is a recruiting poster, obviously, for the U.S. Merchant Marine. Um, and it, it says, you bet I'm going back to sea. And what that means is, uh, yes, a lot of ships are getting sunk. Maybe some of my friends have been killed. Maybe I've been torpedoed. But I'm going to get back on another ship, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to sail it, because somehow this stuff needs to get to our troops. And most merchant mariners took that position. But what strikes me about this poster is the image of the mariner. And he is a Hey, Lord knows, a tough looking guy. But he also looks, you know, maybe he might not be the kind of guy necessarily that you'd want to bring home to dinner with your family. And that was really the reputation that the Merchant Marine had during World War II. They were not welcomed home with ticker tape parades like the men in the military. They weren't really in home at all. When the war was over, their job just continued, except now they were bringing the troops home. And then when they were going back over there, they were hauling supplies and things to help rebuild the, you know, the nations and the cities in Europe that had been shattered by the war. And then later on, the Marshall Plan. So they didn't have a lot of close, powerful allies in Washington, D.C. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt was a big supporter of theirs, but he died before the war ended. And 
in Congress, there just nobody really ever got around to uh, including the Merchant Mariners in the GI Bill, or giving them government benefits, or, or really doing very much for them. And there were some people that really, yeah, particularly the Navy, that really didn't like the Merchant Marine. They said, you know, these guys are undisciplined. You know, they're not. They don't follow orders as if they, as if they didn't care enough to try to save their own lives. Uh, others said they got paid too much because again they were civilians. They were union guys. They got paid bonuses for sailing in, uh, you know, hauling explosive cargo or sailing through dangerous waters. But they weren't paid like everybody else. They, uh, among other things, they they didn't start getting paid until the voyage began, and they stopped getting paid the moment it ended, even if it ended with a torpedo strike in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> So they were off the clock. They were on their own time when they were swimming for their lives. Um, others said, you know, they're draft dodgers. Why aren't they in the military? But many of the, a number of the Matthews guys, I mean, they were veteran mariners, and they wanted to be in the military. And the, the, the Navy, the military said, no, you know, we'll, we can always draft more infantry. But what we really need are guys that know how to sail these ships, because we're building more of them all the time. We've got a shortage of men. You stay in the merchant marine. That's the best thing you can do for us. And if they were dodging the draft to save themselves, they miscalculated very badly because the U.S. Merchant Marine suffered a higher casualty rate than any branch of the U.S. military. Only the U.S. Marines came close. Uh, there are efforts in Congress to have been for years to come back and give these guys some money or give them some recognition or something, but they, these, and there's some going on right now. But they never really seem to go anywhere. And I think that's a shame. I think it reflects poorly on our country. But honestly, the, the Matthews guys that I talked to, I don't even think they knew that there was anything going on with Congress. I think most of them gave up a long time ago, expecting the government to come back after all these years and say, you know, we should have done better by you. Here's a check or here's a, you know, here's a medal or something. But what a lot of them did tell me was that they wished that the public knew what they did. One guy said, uh, he said, maybe when your book comes out, my grandkids will finally believe that I did something worthwhile during the war. And I hope that's true. But the time for even that is getting very short. Uh, a lot of these guys now that sail are in their 90s. And um, when I started working on this book in earnest in 2011, 2012, there were maybe 15 old Matthews men who sailed against the U-boats living in and around Matthews. Today there's three. And uh, one of my favorite Matthews men, Bill Callis, who appears in the book, um, one of the, I interviewed him numerous times, and he told me once, he said, you want me to read this book you're writing, you better hurry up and get it written. <laughs> and, uh, I said, okay, Bill, because that's what he would say to Bill in a situation like that. But uh, three weeks later, I went to his funeral. Um, I went to one of the Hodges, Hodges' son's funeral just two weeks ago. So that's sort of a bittersweet feeling for me to be talking about the book and writing the book. I, uh, I'm very proud of the book. I uh, wanted to write a book since I was about five years old. And I'm really happy the way this turned out. But I wish I had figured out a way to tell this story earlier. I wish I'd figured out a way to tell it 20 years ago. Um, that's really about all I've got to say. Uh, I would be happy if we, I don't know if we, if we have time, I'd be happy to take any of your, your questions. Uh, I just want to mention, I believe it was in the 80s, there was an act of Congress, my father was involved in that, giving veteran status to the men of the Merchant Marine. That uh, covered 1941 to 1946. Right. So, uh, they did. And that was, that, was a, that was of some help to them. Uh, but they didn't, you know, it didn't make up for a lot of the uh, the years that they didn't have that. But you're right, that was that was of some significance. Yeah. But it, there's there's a lot more to uh, <laughs> to be a lot a lot more to go. But question: I know they had uh, uh, the big school at Sheepshead Bay to train a lot of the merchant mariners during the war, and it was open until uh, 1954. Uh, that was at the southern end near Colony Island. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, where were the uh, masters? Where were they uh, given their final training? 
Well, a lot of them. You mean in the, in, during the war? During the war, yes. A lot of them were. You know, they were. They had. Uh, they they were masters when the war began. They were just. They were just brought into the. A lot. All the Matthews guys. Very very few of them went to uh, had the formal training. They were the. They came up through the hoss pipe. They. Uh, you know. They. They. Did it through through experience, and then they sat for the tests. So uh, most of them, you know, still were ma were masters before the war even began. But so I think there were more than five or seven thousand ships that were built during the war. Yeah. So we had to have some pipeline to do that. Uh, Sheepshead Bay was where they had all the unlicensed mariners who were taught their skills, and you had other places where they were, like for example, Catalina. You had an officer school out in Alameda, California, during World War II, where they trained the men to be merchant officers. Mm -hmm. But they don't know on the East Coast where that was. I, I'm not sure where I'll hang where they were. Uh, when was sonar introduced, and how long did it take us to test to make those submarines? Uh, well, sonar, when when there was a there was a sonar was was already already existed before before the war. They had used it. Before that, but they mean our navy. Or yeah, our navy. I mean, it was wide. It was widely used by by both sides, but it was it was only as it was only so effective. It, it could detect a sonar is a you bounce waves yeah, off yeah, of, yeah, we and it. okay, and uh, but it was only so effective. And the the big one of the biggest advances that that defeated the U boats was the development and the improvement of radar, because. As long as a because that made it U boats before before we developed radar which could see them you know above the water um, and, and and fit it onto planes U boats could always like at night and you know they, they could surface and you know on a cloudy in the clouds uh, they were pretty safe up there but once we had radar any time they surfaced a uh, a ship. Or just a plane could come hurtling out of the blue and and sink them before they could before they could submerge. Okay, so by what time? What by what year of, of World War II was the back broken of the U boats? Probably, in, I would say, in the middle of 1943. Definitely. Yeah, um, and there were improvements going all along, but there was sort of things the. And it, it was not just a technology, but it was training, particularly in the United States. The British had been at it since, you know, since the late 30s. But the United States, I mean, fighting U-boats is a very specialized uh, form of warfare. And the U-boat commanders have been doing this for years. At the beginning of the war, we were, we in the United States were, uh, you know, we didn't lack for courage or, or energy, but we were new to this. And it took us a couple of years to get up to speed and to be able to match, really match wits with these guys. So you had, you had technology and training, plus we were producing vessels. We, we had more ships that we could, and planes, and equipping them with radar. So all of that, all of those things sort of came together. Air cover. Air cover. Air cover. Finally and, provided. Yeah, in a, in a critical mass. Once we got planes, once we got ships that we could use to protect convoys, um, and in the middle of 1943, suddenly things turned and by the end of the war it was a suicide mission to be in a U-boat. I mean at the beginning of the war they were the you know they the U-boat force attracted the best and the brightest. By the end of the war they were pulling guys off the street saying you're gonna be in a U-boat. They were going, oh no, because it was uh, the casualty rates of the U-boats in the last couple of years of war were were appalling. And it was a, it really was a suicide mission. But it took to answer your question it turned in the spring of 1943, and it was like it was almost like somebody hit a switch. But it wasn't any one thing. It was a there was a bunch of different factors coming together. And I, and I address this in the I describe this in, in a little more detail in the in the book. <coughs> Sir, the bullets and gulls that we carry in your your story and this museum. So the gentleman who founded this museum was an engineer. And merchant ships uh, and tankers in World War II. He was torpedoed twice and you know, pulled out of the Atlantic twice. And he went on to sell uh, uh, maritime engines for Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. And then he bought a couple of shipyards in Mexico. I won't go into the rest of his life. He passed away about five years ago. And one of the my fellow docents, who's since passed away, 
uh, served uh, at a gun tub in a uh, merchant ship during World War II. He was, he was U.S. Navy. The Navy was, Armed Guard. Yeah, he was yeah. part of the Armed Guard. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a strong affiliation with your story. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's great. Sir? You know, as a comment to your excellent presentation, you know, and I'm sure that all of you guys know, in the uh, island of Galveston, they have a beautiful submarine that you can tour. And uh, I got a chance to visit it just last weekend, and I was very highly impressed how, how well maintained this submarine is. It matches your presentation very accurately. Thank you. Is it, is it Amer American stuff, I guess? It's the USS Cabal. Oh, okay. S yeah. Sank the uh, Japanese aircraft carrier Chikaku in the Battle of the Philippines. Oh, okay. So, is that Mark? They have a little Japanese <laughs> carrier painted on the side of the conning tower. All right. Yep. My father was in the Archer Brand during the war. He was aboard, I think, the Alma. I know it's called the Red Navy. <laughs> I found a little notebook. Apparently, they weren't really supposed to keep diaries, but he made some notes. Uh, he was in a convoy, and he was saying that one of the ships had broken down for whatever reason, engine trouble, or lost the rudder, whatever. But he said that uh, they just had to go on and leave them because if they stopped, then everybody went down. Right. So they just left that ship as a, a sitting duck. There was nothing they could do, and he said that he was very frightened, but that it was his job. And he was self taught, he was, he finished either fourth or fifth grade, but <clears throat> at the end of the war, he was chief engineer. Mm -hmm. He was like a lot of these Matthews guys, then he just came up through experience. But that, what you're saying about the convoys, I mean, that was standard practice that you know, the convoy could not stop if a ship broke down. Um, they, I mean, you couldn't, sac the convoy was going slowly enough as it was, but at least it was protected. But if a ship broke down, um, they would, you know, they started straggling behind. And new boats often would tail, you know, they didn't want to attack into the teeth of the convoy's defenses, but they would kind of trail them and wait for a ship to break down and be helpless back there. And those ships were, uh, you know, you didn't want to be on one of those ships that had engine trouble and had to fall behind the convoy. Because although surely you were a, a, a U boat was going to find you. He said the convoys helped, but it was still, they were extremely vulnerable, mm -hmm. even with the, the convoy. Yeah, and the, and the U boats knew how to deal with, with, you know, they had tactics for dealing with convoys, and, uh, uh, but, but without convoys, it was, a, it, was a, it was really a turkey shoot. So, yeah. yeah. I want to ask you about Kings Point, the U.S. Marine Academy, uh -huh. and you, you didn't mention their role in all of this, but obviously they were founded in 1943, so right. uh, mm -hmm. and they honor, uh, I've been here many times, they honor, you know, Merchant Mario, so mm -hmm. is that, how did they get the book, or did you put it in the book? They, but I did, it's not, it may be mentioned in the book, I'm not, I, I don't recall, but they, uh, I didn't, Yes, they, they were, were founded basically to help, mm -hmm. you know, because there was a, a great demand for these, for these guys. Yes. And they were found, they were in one of a number of maritime academies that were hurriedly founded to, to turn out mariners. Mm -hmm. And they, they had a, 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 a great contribution to the war effort. They, as it happens, again, most of the Matthews guys were, were self-taught. Mm -hmm. Very few of them went to... Uh, I, I can't think of any offhand that went to King's Point. Some of them went to the others. So King's Point, for the, you're, you're absolutely right, but for the purposes of the, of the Matthews men, King's Point did not play a large role in, the, in their in their story. But but no, you're you're absolutely right. And I'm going to go speak. Oh, actually, I'm going to speak at the Sunni Maritime. Very good. Yeah, That's you know, right across. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I saw that. Yeah. Point, so yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the modern merchant marine? I mean, we have a friend who uh, was on the merchant marine in the South Pacific supplying various bases, mm -hmm. but I don't know anything about where the merchant marine is now. What, where, what, do they, what is their mission now? Well, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, and I, I got a, a good look at this when I uh, when I was working for Maersk, which I um, which was in the late 
uh, maybe 2009 through 2013. But the Merchant Marine now is, is honestly a, uh, uh, much diminished from, from World War II. And it is not, uh, there are Merchant Mariners and even a couple of Matthews men who are engaged in the uh, Merchant Marine and international trade. But it's, we are, uh, we are kind of been, been squeezed out of the, or priced out of the, the business um, of hauling cargo from, you know, to different countries. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. One is that U.S. merchant mariners are paid reasonably well, and you can find uh, mariners from the Philippines or Eastern Europe to sail these ships for, you know, a third or fourth of what our guys make. Uh, you know, it's like everything else. It's like making sweatshirts or making widgets in, in China or the Philippines that, you know, that we, you know, they're cheaper for us, but they're, we don't, we don't have the jobs. Uh, also, the uh, a U.S. flagged ship is, you know, it's subject to Coast Guard regulations, which can be expensive. It's subject to the legal requirements protecting the mariners, and all those things add to the cost. So, uh, a lot of shipping companies, including Maersk, that I worked for, would only, uh, we would never even bid on a contract unless it specified that it had to be U.S. merchant mariners, it had to be a U.S. flag ship. We wouldn't even bid because we couldn't, we couldn't um, compete. A lot of the Matthews men, um, now if you sail within the United States from port to port, then you, you, that's, you, you can do that. And a lot of, uh, and a lot of them, uh, the Matthews guys are now in tugboats. They've sort of made the move. A few of them sailed, uh, but a lot of the, most of the, um, most of the U.S. cargo ships, the, the international ships that are in, on the sea today, are heavily subsidized by the government because they have to be, or else they can't compete in the open market. And we have, there's a program, and the government uh, subsidizes them for, for the main reason that the, it's in the government's interest to maintain the fleet of U.S. flagged ships in an emergency, so if their war breaks out and wherever, they can have ships that they can call on because they can't just call up a, a, you know somebody that has a you know another ship. But they can a U.S. flagged ship in this uh, they call it the Maritime Security Program, and the ships in this program receive millions of dollars a year just to be in the program. They don't even necessarily have to do that. But the understanding is, you know, if they get a call that you know we a war has broken out in wherever, uh, we need you to haul some stuff. They're required to pull into the nearest port, offload whatever cargo they're carrying, and go pick up whatever the cargo the military wants them to carry, and take it wherever the military wants it to go. And that is, uh, sad to say, or, or sad, but it, I, I think it is, that is really the bulk of the U.S. Uh, flag merchant fleet now in international trade. Uh, we asked anybody here. Uh, back in WW2, were there any Japanese Americans in the Merchant Marine? Um, how, how about African Americans? Were they any? There were some African Americans. It's uh, and the in those days the uh, uh, African Americans were generally relegated to the uh, uh, jobs of cook and messman and steward. You know the. the the lower ranking jobs, but a number of them, and one, one African American guy from Matthews was killed on it, was killed on the ship. Um, what was the first thing you, you asked? Oh, the, oh, I want to tell you about the Japanese. It's interesting. Lisa, yeah, I know they were in the Army, but I don't know if they were in the Merchant Marine. I, I imagine some of them were, but, but what I want to tell you about is that the Japanese during World War II did not target American shipping the way the U boats did. The Japanese submarine fleet was was, they, and they, if they got a chance, they would they would sink a you know an American cargo ship. But their main function, and they were they were pretty much limited by their commanders to protecting the big Japanese warships. So the Japanese did not did not sink nearly as did not target our merchant ships, but we targeted the Japanese merchant ships, because Japan, you know, like uh, Britain, is an island, and they were heavily dependent on the, uh, the merchant fleet to supply them. And we recognized that, and our submarines just devastated the Japanese merchant fleet. We targeted them, but they didn't target us. The Germans targeted us. Uh, let me, uh, you want to ask another? 
touch on it, uh, uh, one of the things that really penalizes Americans in shipping, I went to sea for 26 years in the Merchant Marine, retired captain, uh, is what's called the Jones Act. Federal law that was uh, created in 1920 it has several different provisions, but one of the onerous ones is uh, whereby it treats the uh, seamen as children, and any of their misbehavior is accepted. I'll give you a case in point. Pulling away from the dock and container ship in uh, Hong Kong, we look up and I see our electrician had just missed the sailing. We were maybe about 50 feet off the dock. I asked the pilot, "Can you just hold it? Uh, we'll bring the launch the tugboat alongside. We'll bring the guy on board. We can we can sail." He made me type up a waiver uh, so that the tugboat would not be sued if this guy fell or whatever. But that's the kind of thing that the Jones Act, even today, uh, allows. And literally, if somebody, a man gets injured or a woman, uh, they remain on full pay until the vessel comes back to the United States, breaks uh, shipping orders. So there's no obligation for responsible behavior. Uh, and uh, that, in many cases, uh, just sinks the overall cost. That's why there's so very few American ship companies that do not take uh, a subsidy. They are uh, under the Jones Act, for example, like Madison Navigation. They trade within the boundaries of the United States territories or, or rural states where they are obligated to use American crews. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We want to thank you so much for coming by today and speaking.